All right, moving on to our next session. Uh, we have a special guest moderator. I'd like to introduce Carol Lockhart from Wolpert, who's going to uh, moderate our session on government agency views on Topo Baffy. Hello, Carol. Hi, Mark. Welcome everybody uh, to our panel providing government agencies views on topobathy LIDAR. Topobathymetric LIDAR has become synonymous with dam development in both coastal and inland regions with multiple agencies requiring varying degrees of accuracy and data density. During this session, government agency representatives will discuss program requirements for Topobathy data, how the data fulfills the mission of their programs, and their vision for how Topobathy can be utilized in the future. Today, we have four distinguished presenters, whom I think most of you will already know, representing NOAA, USGS, and the Army Corps of Engineers. In the interest of time, we aren't going to read everybody's biography, but you can find that in the program guide. Each presenter will have approximately 10 minutes to present, after which we'll do a Q&A. So please uh, enter all your questions as you think of them in the Q&A box. If your question is for a specific panelist, uh, please note that too. We're going to be hearing from, in this order, Mike Islaxon, the Chief of Remote Sensing Division, uh, National Geodetic Survey, NOAA followed by Jeff Danielson, Coastal National Elevation Database Applications Project Chief uh, for USGS. Then we'll have Cindy Thatcher, Elevation Planning and Management Lead for USGS. Also on the line to help answer any questions is Jason Stoker, the Acting Chief of the USGS National Geospatial Program Topographic Data Services. And last but not least, only because her name was last alphabetically, Jennifer Wozencraft, the Director of the Joint Airborne Lit LIDAR bath Bathymetry Technical Center of Expertise, or Jabaltex Army Corps of Engineers. So first up is, is Mike, over to you. All right, thank you. Again, as a, thank you for the opportunity here. Again, I've spoken and, and been participating from apps uh, for, for many, many years. And, and again, I've always uh, liked to come to talk to you all and give you updates what's going on at NGS and then within my group, uh, the Coastal Mapping Program. Again, uh, within the NGS, as most of you are aware, uh, we define and maintain uh, the National Spatial Reference System. That's the consistent latitude, longitude, height, as well as uh, within NGS, I'm one of six divisions. And then within my, my division, RSD, we have three primary programs, uh, the Aeronautical Survey Program, where we establish standards and QA uh, data for the FAA on airports and airport obstructions, uh, the Coastal Mapping Program, which I'll talk to you about today, and then an emergency response uh, capability, which we primarily respond to providing georeference symmetry post hurricane. So within the, the NGS coastal mapping program it is, you know, congressionally directed for us to conduct remote sensing of the coastal regions of the U.S. Uh, and define the national shoreline primarily to support safety and navigation. Uh, that will be no nautical charts, uh, but as you well know, there's lots of uses to the data, both for the shorelines as, as well as for the near shore bathymetry. Uh, the source of data that we use are, again, LIDARs, topobathy LIDARs, which we'll talk about, uh, digital cameras, uh, high-resolution satellites, and uh, evaluating and, and, and seeing in the near future UAS as being a, an additional provider of, of data. So in any one year, this is kind of what we deliver uh, for, for FY20, the metrics uh, uh, can you read through them and speak for themselves. Again, this isn't solely done um, internal to, to my group. Uh, we, we, we leverage and partner in our capacities with the private sector. But as you can see, uh, we, we are certainly focused on providing data in and around the major ports, of which there's 175 in order to enable the national economy, as well as ultimately we update over uh, up to uh, 270 nautical charts. We have the single largest update to no nautical charts between the shoreline and the near shore bathymetry. How do we do it? Uh, we, we do it both with NOAA and contract aircraft. Uh, again, we, we have uh, two sensors, uh, Planix DSS cameras, as well as uh, Hexacon Chiroptera. Uh, we have one of those, but our capacity, as I said, uh, is within our contractors. Uh, we have a uh, large IDIQ that we just awarded this past year with Four Pines, Dewberry, Fugru, Quantum Spatial, and Wolpert. All with them with large, large teams and uh, primarily small business to support those teams. Priorities uh, here and now. Uh, again, we've had a, a legacy of, of successful supplementals, uh, starting with, with Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, 
and, and currently taking in delivery uh, of, of the data from Harvey, Irma, and Maria, and uh, also working and expect uh, middle of next year, late next year, Florence, Michael, and Super Typhoon U2 that impacted the uh, interest of the U.S. and in, in the Marianas. Uh, again, huge projects uh, when you're talking about the 2017 supplemental of over 4,000 square miles of LIDAR imagery and shoreline. And then even more uh, exhausting to me, at least, has been the 2018 season. Where we've got over 8,000 square miles of data that has been collected successfully uh, by, by our contractors, and, and those data deliveries are coming in. Uh, have worked, and again, are working through possible supplements for FY20. Uh, I feel for all of y'all in the Gulf and what has happened this year, but uh, again, be aware that uh, there has been we have been asked about uh, impacts and, and where we would like to do update work uh, from these storms. Also in FY21, these are two, uh, two contracts uh, uh, that, that we are working through task orders right now. One is uh, within the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Uh, this is to help support NOAA priorities in the Pacific, uh, supporting NOAA hydrographic operations. These would start in the islands just to the northwest of, of Kauai, out to French Frigate Shoals, including Ahoa and Necker, and then picking up on some of the projects um, in South Tampa Bay, uh, highlighted there in the yellow. Uh, hopefully aware to all of you was the, the presidential memorandum uh, uh, addressing Alaska, spe specifically the EEZ and the, and, the, and the shoreline and near shore of Alaska on November 19th. Uh, monumental to me, my my career of, of working shoreline and having the president actually say shoreline and near shore uh, mapping as a priority. And, and again, uh, you could read through here uh, the tasking to NOAA, uh, but this also has resulted in plus up in, in our budget for NOAA for $4 million and the president's budget for this year to, to uh, increase the amount of work and focus on this priority that was issued to us. So again, uh, as you can see, you know, the data speaks for itself. Uh, on the left there in New Bedford, uh, you can see the actual scow marks from the dredge. Um, you can see in the lower uh, there in Marathon, you know, the, the canal there, the, the channel uh, uh, of the data there. And over to the right, uh, those, uh, those uh, look like parked cars in, that, in the water there are actually oyster beds. So the, the data and the systems have, are just providing phenomenal definition of data we've never seen before. These are, of course, the hardest places to survey, as you would imagine. And, and again, our priority is supporting uh, not only increasing the efficiency and safety of our operations in the hydrographic fleet, uh, but also providing these multi-use data sets to feed things, uh, not only charting, but inundation mapping and a multitude of other uses. Uh, again, our, our goal as attempt is, is to get to that four meter navigation limit line or null line but the systems today are often delivering data much deeper than that. In fact, uh, the contract support of uh, Wolpert showed that they could get 50 meters in, in Guam when they did the U2 surveys. And that's just an immense savings of sea days, uh, as well as more importantly, the safety. Uh, NOAA's actually has lost, uh, you know, a, a rolled over launch and lost a, a NOAA employee back in the early 90s working inshore. So again, keeping these folks offshore is, is, a, is a priority to us. As evident to hear, uh, Again, Puerto Rico, this is actually Jabotex data. Uh, we work closely. We are a member of the Jabotex along with the GS and Navy. And so we, we leverage and use each other's data and coordinate as best as we can. Uh, and what you can see here is those yellow soundings are actually seasonal uh, topopathy LIDAR data. And the black soundings are actually a NOAA launch where it was able to use the pre-existing LIDAR data to navigate in and collect those other areas deeper uh, than, than the ladder could get, but also highlights those those coral heads, which they were able, able to safe, safely navigate around. And from the shoreline standpoint, we'll we'll use the LIDAR dam, run it through V-Datum, so that way we can get it to a tidal reference, and then we'll contour that shoreline, whether mean higher water or mean low low water. We also leverage imagery. We, we, you know, part of the requirement is to collect imagery with the LIDAR. We also do standalone tide coordinate stereo collection of imagery, because some areas, again, LIDAR just doesn't work. So again, another source that we use, as you can see, being exploited here. And this is some of the outcomes, as you see the detail. And ultimately, we're updating this chart. 
the data is distributed uh, through a couple of different things, the vector and, and raster and some of the other data through the NOVA Shoreline Data Explorer and Elpo Left. We partner and leverage our, our Office of Coastal Manage Management uh, sister agency through the digital coast. And so the LIDAR and imagery that we collect is disseminated there as well as the other Japotex partners. We have funded and are, are working towards something, uh, a TPU, Total Propagated Uncertainty. Uh, again, this is a priority to NOAA and, and navigation to under, understand the uncertainties of LIDAR. Uh, currently, uh, we have done this for the Regal, the Regal systems. Uh, we're working the Chiroptera now. And then we are currently, and then Hawkeye and Seasmill are, are the follow-on sensors to look for this tool. And this tool will be available to, to the contractors and manufacturers alike. But again, to understand the uncertainty is important for us to actually understand uh, what we're putting on the chart. And we've also worked out, uh, again, a bit of an eye chart here, but just, you know, not only collecting data that we have, but also as, uh, the folks from Javotex and other sources were able to, to take this data uh, from a topographic larger grid and incorporate it into the hydrographic operations and how they disseminate data, which ultimately updates the chart. So I kind of defined the use cases. These were some of the, the questions, and I kind of highlighted the, the important parts. Um, uh, uh, what I haven't talked about is how and will things change. You know, we believe that sensors will allow for both high-density data to be collected uh, with the capability of getting deeper and more consistent returns in challenging environments. Uh, again, that's a priority to us in the future, especially as we focus on Alaska. Um, some of the biggest challenges operationally you can imagine, whether it's wind, weather, and waves, and tides or water clarity, but data processing by far is, is our biggest challenge and, and the amounts of data we get and how long it takes to, to process. And if I had something fun to tell about a Topopathy project, well, I can tell you about uh, going through acceptance testing on a sensor on an aircraft that just came out of anti-corrosion and that aircraft leaking anti-corrosion all over that brand new sensor, which uh, didn't result in really good results. But anyway, and that's all I have and thank you, Carol. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll be sharing this talk with Cindy Thatcher. Um, the USGS Coastal Marine Hazards and Resources Program within USGS has a long history of using topobathymetric LIDAR for coastal change, um, looking at hazard assessments, as well as, as, well as examining ecosystem services. Um, and we've We've done this yeah, using the partnership with private services through contracts. As you see, a number of surveys here acquired uh, by various vendors over, over time. And um, the, the coastal program also has a long standing relationship with the Joint Airborne Lighter Bathymetry Technical Center of Expertise on trying to extend the coverage of surveys to meet the needs of the program. Um, and just one example up in New Jersey, where we focused on looking at um, wetland sediment transportation rates. Um, in terms of use cases for the coastal program, you know, there is a need within the coastal program to take topobathy data across the nation and to integrate it into larger models that is done by the Coastal National Elevation Database, for example, and also NOAA, NCI, and other groups to where we have these DEMs that are integrated with sonar, bathy LIDAR, and other sources to drive science applications and science modeling. So, you know, some of the prime modeling systems within the coastal program are COAST, which is the sediment transport model, and as well as the COSMOS, the coastal storm modeling system. It's a very advanced numerical modeling system that assesses coastal flood inundation hazards, but also accounts for wind, wave, current, storm surge, things like that. But, you know, bathymetric LIDAR is critical to both of those modeling systems to understand that near shore transition from offshore to onshore and in terms of the modeling dynamics. Um, coastal change hazards is at the forefront of the coastal program. Looking at, looking at coastal erosion, it's the, it's, the, it's the congressional mandate of the coastal program to look at shoreline change. And this is one example of, you know, of projections over Hurricane Zeta. But, um, Bathymetric LIDAR has been essential to the coastal program for looking at coastal change hazards and, and uh, looking at erosion. Um, you know, within the realm of bathy LIDAR, it's helping to, you know, 
to drive decision support. And you know, this is one example where storm surge modeling grids are being updated with topopathy data and also various other data sources like sonar. But um, to get that to get that detail in along the Bear Islands and features like that, we need to have you know very good bathymetric LiDAR coverage. Um, obviously, some of these areas, like in the Gulf of Mexico, is challenging, but um, we try and use what data we have. Um, you know, these models are going to drive all kinds of applications, though, from, from looking at uh, storm surge to looking at uh, the, the Louisiana Coastal Protection Restoration Authority's Coastal Master Plan, the National Water Model. There, there's a number of applications that drive out of the use of bathymetric LIDAR data. Um, you know, as the USGS as a whole, we started thinking about how we see this technology going. And we definitely see, you know, an increased use of both shallow and deep water sensors to drive science applications. Because there's various features that, you know, can be accessed by both shallow and deep water systems. Um, but, you know, really on the processing side, we see where there could be some gains down the road and how to extract more information from, from, from the waveform signatures, you know, mind that signal as much as possible. Uh, the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning to gain efficiencies in, in classification and, and downstream product generation. And also, you know, cloud computing and also high performance computing will obviously gain us some efficiencies. And, you know, besides, you know, bathy lighter, there's other techniques that could be that could use this, that could use these techniques as well, such as satellite derived bathymetry and and satellite based structure for motion. Um, challenges for topopathy. This is not new to anyone in this audience, but you know, obviously, all the environmental conditions play across these various uh, uh, surveys. Um, you know, the riverside. I'll let Cindy talk more, but you know, we we see a lot of factors that affect some of that. Um, but on the planning side, you know, with, within USGS, we have a lot of interest in pre and post storm response. And the timing is always a factor with some of that. And, and uh, the spatial and temporal changes are, you know, dynamically along the coast and how we account for some of that. Um, this is one example where the USGS is moving on trying to model uh, help in partnership with the Bureau of Reclamation trying to help with volume estimates in the, in the reservoirs by helping to compute area capacity curves. And there's a significant need to have seamless topo across the reservoirs and landscapes. And uh, this is where we've actually used in a bunch of different sources from topographic LIDAR and other elevation sources to look at the carbon across the reservoir landscapes into the future Bathymetric water is critical for helping help meet this mission. And, and I'm going to pass it on now to Cindy. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, so if you want to move on to the next slide. So um, at USGS, we've seen a growing interest in bathymetric LIDAR for inland applications, um, especially as we see the instruments continue to improve. Um, so USGS sees flood modeling as the top application for inland bathymetry, but some other key applications include fish habitat restoration, um, drinking water protection, dam removal science, um, bed form geomorphology, and sediment transport modeling. Um, so kind of an interesting example um, was a recent Potomac River survey. Um, our funding partner on that project is, is planning to use the data for modeling uh, how toxic spills could affect drinking water supply intakes. So um, next slide. So for the Klamath River in California, um, there's a, a really large dam removal project being planned. So we partnered with NOAA uh, to acquire um, Bathy LIDAR data along the river. And that data is meant to support uh, salmon habitat restoration and for also research on the impacts of dam removal um, on sediment movement and fish habitat. Um, and also on this project, the Corps of Engineers collected sonar data there. So it was a really nice interagency partnership project. Um, next slide. 
So the 3D national terrain model is part of the next generation of 3D, which will include um, inland bathymetry, hydro derived from LIDAR, and connections to groundwater and engineered hydrologic systems. And so this 3D NTM, um, we think will provide critical data for flood forecasting, for 3D geologic mo modeling and many other applications. So next slide. Um, so this is the vision for developing the 3D national train model. Um, I'm not gonna really go into this ex except to point out to you um, there in step five that um, it's highlighted that inland bathymetry is going to be a key element of this. Um, so next slide. So um, um, the USGS and NOAA are collaborating on the 3D Nation study. And here's some preliminary, preliminary results up there in the left corner. Um, so we're seeing um, that there is a strong interest in inland bathymetry on the federal and state government side, especially. Um, and they see that as important for their mission critical activities. And so to support this, um, USGS has begun acquiring Bathy LIDAR through commercial vendors. Um, and we're trying to gain a better understanding of how the environmental co conditions affect um, the success of the surveys and also to gain more experience with you know, writing the task orders and conducting the QC procedures. Uh, so next slide. So um, this is my last slide. I just wanted to show you um, where NGP has completed or planned Bathy LIDAR projects. Um, so like I mentioned, we're acquiring the data through commercial ven vendors um, using the GYPSI contract. And uh, we're publishing the data on the national map along with, um, we're also publishing the, the CONED models that um, Jeff's team creates for in the coastal areas. So that's kind of an update from USGS, that's all I had. Thank you Thank very, you much, very Cindy much, Cindy and Cindy Jeff. And Jeff. Um, okay, next up is uh, Jennifer Walsencraft. Jennifer, are you on online with us? And thanks again for the opportunity to talk to you guys today about um, topobathy LIDAR and how we're, um, I guess, approaching that in the Jalbatux and the Corps of Engineers National Coastal Mapping Program, which are the two activities that I will talk to you about um, today. I wanted to start with Jalbatux. You saw the beautiful work that Mike and Jeff and Cindy just presented that um, NOAA and USGS have been involved in in topobathy LIDAR. And one of the questions we always get is, are you guys all working together? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. We are working together in a number of ways, but um, I guess the one where the rubber really meets the road is the Joint Airborne LIDAR Bathymetry Technical Center of Expertise, where we've really been working together, I guess, formally for the past 22 years, uh, maybe informally about 10 years before that on operations and research and development in airborne LIDAR bathymetry and complementary airborne coastal mapping and charting technologies. Um, to both advance the technology um, as well as its application to our coastal challenges. And we have had a long history of working with not only the four agency partners in the Jalbatex, which along with NOAA, USGS, and the Corps of Engineers, we also have the Naval Oceanographic Office um, as a partner of Jalbatex, but other folks in the federal government, large um, industry group that we work with, as well as academia. And I always say on this slide, if your logo is missing and you feel like it needs to be there, please send it to me and we'll make sure that it gets um, on the slide. Our physical office location is down in South Mississippi, um, where all those hurricanes and Mike's um, graphics showed hit recently. So we've um, had an interesting year with that and COVID. And then we also try to have an annual workshop um, where we present all of our activities that we've done um, in the previous year. This year, we um, just canceled it, but we're looking at rescheduling that for, oh, I got the year wrong here, but September 2021, maybe in South Mississippi, depending on how everything goes. And the main activities we've been working on this year are testing new sensors and sharing those results among the partners. And we'll present those at the workshop, as well as working on an inland bathy LIDAR specification for the USGS that we're hoping will also double um, to meet our requirements for 
um, producing a standard ocean mapping protocol or a BATHY LIDAR, BATHY LIDAR section of the standard ocean mapping protocol that will support that national ocean mapping exploration and characterization strategy that Mike mentioned, as well as looking at um, how uh, technologies like satellite-derived asymmetry and satellite-based structure from motion can meet the, re the requirements of all of our programs. Down at the physical office of the Java Techs in South Mississippi, the Corps of Engineers and Navy own a suite of sensors that are operated by contract. So I wanted to mention specifically to this group that we're working on the developing the next solicitation for that contract, which I hope will come out in the next six months. And I think we actually had a source of thought post yesterday um, to support the market research effort and the, the development of that solicitation. So I wanted to be sure and let you know that opportunity was out there. Um, this is government-owned equipment operated by a contract that's let through the Mobile District, and it's for year-round um, and year-round operations worldwide for the Navy, the Corps of Engineers National Coastal Mapping Program, and of course our post-storm work that we do for the Corps of FEMA and other um, partners. Um, moving into the National Coastal Mapping Program segment of my presentation. Um, I wanted to first tell you a little bit about what the Corps of Engineers does in the coastal zone in case you're not aware. We have um, navigation projects where we're taking sediment out of, out of navigation channels to make sure they're deep enough to support the national commerce. We um, have coastal storm risk management projects or beach projects where we're putting sand on the beach to provide a le level of, I guess, risk reduction in the event of coastal storms. And then we also do ecosystem restoration projects where we're placing sediments to encourage wetland growth or to create habitat for sensitive species. So we have all those activities going on in the coastal zone. The Corps first started, um, I guess, investing in the development of bathy LIDAR technology back in the mid-1980s. And they were looking just for another hydrographic survey capability to support dredge payment surveys where they would survey before and after a dredge event at a channel, and that's what the um, dredging contractors got paid based on. But it turns out um, the technology was not really great for that application, but it was, was really good at um, creating uh, beautiful, high-resolution, high-accuracy regional data sets. And about the same time, the Corps of Engineers was moving from a project management paradigm to a regional sediment management paradigm where we were looking at, um, I guess, managing our navigation, beach, and ecosystem restoration projects as a system instead of as individual components. So there was a need for regional data sets about the same time as the technology came online. So back in 2004, our headquarters started the National Coastal Mapping Program to address that need for those big regional data sets to enable us to do regional sediment management or to manage our projects as a, as a system instead of as individual components. So we started back in 2004 at the Mississippi-Louisiana line. We worked counterclockwise around the coast of the U.S. from Florida up the East Coast through the Great Lakes down the West Coast and finished our first cycle in 2010. The second one we finished in 2016. And the third, we're hoping to finish in 2021 if all of those budget things that were um, discussed in the prior session um, come through in a timely manner. Um, and on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see some of the beautiful data sets that we're um, producing with the program and the topobathy LIDAR capability. We collect 500 meters onshore to 1,000 meters offshore, and we collect high-resolution aerial photography as well as hyperspectral imagery at the same time to support the program. We learned early in the program that our engineers and scientists out in the districts didn't have the tools that they needed to process these data sets or, or analyze them to get answers um, out of them, and they ended up on Databricks on somebody's shelf and not being used. So we started developing what we call a suite of standard products. So these are pretty basic digital surface models, digital elevation models, um, mosaics of our imagery. And then we also started building tools to work on top of them. So we have a toolbox that lets people compute elevation change, volume change, and shoreline change from our data sets, as well as presenting a lot of our different um, products that we produce through web applications. I guess I've got the way people use data on the outsides of the slides. Um, the Corps of Engineers, I'll focus on those first. Um, Again, the primary use is to develop regional volume change um, quantities to put in regional sediment budgets for regional sediment management. We've integrated that with an enterprise tool called the Sediment Budget Analysis System that people use to store their sediment budgets. 
we use the data to do coastal structure asset management to evaluate whether our coastal structures meet their design profile or if they don't or they at least um, we do modeling to see if they're at least meeting uh, their functional performance of the structure. We um, quantify the capacity of our upland dredge placement sites. When we take sediment out of navigation channels, we have to put it somewhere. Sometimes that's in the water and sometimes it's upland. So we have to make sure we have capacity to place those for each dredging event. We looked at the impacts of our navigation channels on adjacent shorelines using our data sets. We use the data as a physical or environmental baseline for um, different management actions, such as channel deepening at our um, navigation projects. And where the water is clear enough, we can actually do channel condition assessment. So determine whether the channels are, um, I guess, dredged or clear to the depth of their congressionally authorized um, depth. On the environmental side, we um, look at design and monitoring of beneficial use sites and natural and nature-based features. We um, extract habitat data to do habitat suitability modeling for sensitive species. We use it as a base layer for, base layer for our navigation portal, as well as just providing on-the-shelf data products for when our um, engineers and scientists are developing feasibility studies that actually tell Congress how much it's going to cost to um, put in one of our coastal projects or build one of our coastal projects so that they can authorize that. Um, we do emergency response, as our previous um, presenters talked about, as well as use the bathymetry and topography to drive our coastal models. And you heard from um, NOAA and USGS about how they use some of our data products as well. Um, our geomorphology R&D, or the R&D section of the National Coastal Mapping Program, is developing new prototype projects that we hope to transition into operational, like the more basic pro products of DIMS and air photos, so that's what this slide is pretty much about. And these are mostly focused on the extraction of coastal metrics, so um, point features or vector features um, extracted from the data. Um, in this case, we're looking at things like the height of the dune, the height of the dune toe, the width of the beach, the beach slope, what's the slope of the near shore, is there a bar, if there is, how far offshore it is, um, things like that. And we're able to use that in a number of ways. We can produce a coastal dashboard for our senior leaders that tells them at a glance what the condition of their coastline is and in this case the pie charts describe our navigation chart not navigation channels or, or projects um, for the coastal texas study we used the metrics in a breachability index so it was an index that described whether the likelihood of a barrier island breaching based on some of those metrics extracted from our data and the south atlantic coastal study we um, used the National Coastal Mapping Program data along with our partner, partners' data to develop um, digital elevation models to support the hydrodynamic and storm modeling for that effort. And then up in the Great Lakes, and I should have mentioned earlier, the dune metric extraction as well as the bluff extraction work that we've done in MCMP was um, highly leveraged with the USGS scientists working in those areas as well. So in the Great Lakes, we were looking at um, bluff retreat rates and how that impacts the sediment budget up on the Great Lakes. And then most recently this year, we've been working on um, a coastal engineering res resilience index with um, CP&E. And that combines some of the metrics with hydrodynamic modeling to say something about how physically resilient the coastline is in the um, face of different of storms of different strengths or water levels. And we're hoping to, I guess, test that on larger areas this year and roll it out nationally in the next couple of years. On the environmental side, um, this is where we combine the LIDAR data with hyperspectral imagery to get some fusion type products that let us do things like benthic um, classifications. We recently done a, did a pilot project up on the western coast of um, Lake Michigan with NOAA. Um, to do a benthic classification up there. And then within the National Coastal Mapping Program, we, were, um, we had a project that looked at developing different dune vegetation indices. Um, we found a bunch in the literature that were done with other types of data and information. And we tried, well, we did develop some Python scripts to produce those different types of metrics with the LIDAR, aerial photography and hyperspectral imagery data. And we're beta testing those these, this year. Um, Next up in line is um, submerged aquatic vegetation that's kind of emerged as a new um, need for the Corps of Engineers. We did some work on the Mississippi Barrier Islands, which is what you see in the slide here. That's Cat Island. But we've also had some recent requests for the Allegheny River and Casco Bay, Maine. So 
that'll be the next, um, I guess, product. We'll try to develop some tools uh, and a prototype product that we might transfer to operations to um, produce a submerged aquatic vegetation layer. And that is all I have. And here's my information if there are questions if you want to reach out later. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, so we're going to, we've heard um, from all the, the programs so far today, and I'm going to start folks off with a little bit of a question. Um, you all either currently or in the past have collected data um, for your programs with your own sensors, uh, but you all, of course, receive data from contractors as well. Uh, does your, what are the challenges your agency has in QCing topobathy data provided by contractors? And I'd like uh, each person to take a turn or each agency to take a turn um, so Jeff and Cindy can, can argue over who answers this for the, for the USGS. Um, but if you could all uh, answer that question, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Jennifer, do you want to go first since you're still on deck? Sure, I can try to take that one. Um, I guess we have, um, you know, a list of QA, QC checkpoint items or checklist items that we check for that we transition to contractors so that they know in advance the things that we're going to be looking for. And that seems to really have um, improved the amount of turnaround that we have to do um, as products are developed and delivered to us. I guess that would probably be the only comment I had on that topic. I guess Mike or Jeff, do you want to say anything? Mike? Yeah, I would say um, the one thing we've seen, which um, like anything in surveying is that uh, if the data is poorly calibrated from the onset, you know, the downstream products become more and more uh, out of spec. And so I think that's one thing that we've we've really uh, focused on working with with our our support. Um, and then the other challenge is like anything we're already working with lidar data. It's just the you know the cleaning and the characterization. Um, that, you know that that uh, and especially as we go forward in the automation of that, you know, that's where we really need to have really good learning data sets. Um, you know a lot of the a lot of the, the private sector folks are innovating some machine learning and AI on LIDAR on the on that part of things, which is where we need to go. Um, but we just got to be careful we train them uh, to do that in, in the correct manner. Um, that's all I got. Thanks, Mike. And uh, Jeff, looks like you're unmuted, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank, well, thank you very much. Um, and I guess, Cindy, I guess we can take team this, but um, you know, I think on USGS side, we, we, we have a long history of, of QA, QC and topographic LIDAR, and we have a good understanding of that. And, 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 but now we're trying to, you know, move forward with trying to establish uh, procedures for, you know, trying to validate and, and, and QA, QC bathymetric LIDAR data in rivers and other landscapes. And, and we're working through trying to adapt procedures that Jennifer's group has set forward and, and uh, we're trying to get our folks to understand that there's multiple layers to a bathymetric point cloud that is the water surface, the water column, the bottom, all these different components you have to look at when you're trying to examine the quality of, you know, bathy wider data. And we're coming up to speed, um, but maybe I'll pass the ball to Cindy for a second too. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah. Um... Jeff's group and Jennifer's group are really helping us with um, figuring out the QC procedures. Um, and one challenge we have in, in rivers is, um, you know, with the rapid moving, rapidly moving water, it's not necessarily safe to wade in to collect ground truth data, or, um, you know, the contractors aren't, um, you know, they, they may not have the um, equipment to, to do a, a sonar survey um, to collect ground truth data. So that's one thing I think we're going to struggle with a little is what data would, do we use to um, do validation with? So. Yeah, absolutely. There's a reason you're flying from the air to start with, yeah, right? So yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark had a question, uh, again, to, to any of you to answer. Obviously, everybody's uh, programs have different purposes, right? So we're collecting LIDAR data for, 
charting um, offshore and inland and perhaps for engineering, for dredging, for sediment monitoring. Um, how does this affect the sensor type you use, the data densities and the accuracies? And maybe another way to ask this is, are you all working on the same accuracy standard, different accuracy standards, or are you working together to develop a suite of accuracy standards? And who wants to take that first? Mike keeps switching his video off, so I have no idea if he's a... <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> So, uh, so Jennifer or Mike, maybe take that first. Jennifer looks like you're you're up. Yeah, Jennifer's yeah, question. I hopefully, say... she'll reference the National Coastal Mapping Strategy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was about to say. As part of the interagency working group on ocean and coastal mapping that Jeff and I co-chair with Ashley Chapel of NOAA, we developed a couple of years ago, maybe five years now, because time flies like that. But um, we developed the National Coastal Mapping Strategy, and as part of that, we did establish quality levels similar to what um, uh, 3DEP did. We used 3DEP as our model, and we tried to um, establish quality levels that had the accuracy component as well as the data density component um, similar to 3DEP. And we're actually, as part of those efforts I mentioned, to do the inland bathymetry specification as well as the standard ocean mapping protocol, we're looking at updating those. Um, and adding to them um, to make something that looks more like the 3 up uh, based LIDAR specification. Mike, do you want to say anything else? Yeah, the only thing I would key on to is that, that data density is important to us for, for doing the shoreline extraction. So, you know, especially in none of the systems, the current uh, modern systems are have that problem, that data density, but, you know, having you know, multiple points per square meter in order to do that, that LIDAR extraction is important. Um, however, I will say it's such a tough environment. Uh, you know, while we, we strive for these standards and densities, if we get something, it's usually uh, something that we haven't gotten before. So it'll be evaluated carefully. Um, but we do have these specifications to work against. So obviously with increased data density now, we are able to, to start looking at uh, mapping inland rivers more and so maybe a question for usgs obviously modern sensors are allowing us to kind of move into that that inland river environment in a in a more efficient way um but how many rivers in the us or, or what percentage of rivers in the us do you think can actually be data can be acquired from the air versus having to use older more traditional techniques do you have any ideas on that is that being looked at um, Jeff and I were talking about that this morning. Um, that's, that's a piece of information we don't have yet that we really are going to need as we develop a national program. Um, we haven't established a criteria yet for, say, the width of the river or the area of a lake that, that we would map. And, um, and the other piece of information that, that um, we don't have yet is um, what environment, what rivers have environmental conditions that would support a, a successful LIDAR survey. And um, I know in the coastal area, um, you all have developed some tools using um, satellite data to look at that. And so that may be a direction that we could go um, is to use some kind of satellite index to look at um, where the conditions are, are good for BAPI LIDAR. So Jeff, did you have? Yeah, I was going to mention that exactly that. Trying to use things like KD four ninety and and maybe you know trying to use some some other layers that the USGS acquires. For example, some of the substrate information over time through the geologic mapping program, and see if we can sort of spatially intersect that with sort of water clarity, and see if we can use that to drive um, where we can po potentially collect rivers of, of opportunity. So maybe a follow-up question that I'll direct to Mike then is, uh, how do you decide uh, if a location is suitable for Tobobathy LIDAR? Uh, great question and something we, we've been working together with the with, with Jabotex, but we've really been leveraging and looking at climatology of, of satellite imagery over, over a year or several years, um, which I can put the links in, in the, uh, the chat screen here. Um, and from that satellite imagery and, and really looking at water clarity or KD, we can build a, a time series of when it might be best to go to a certain area based on, on that look. 
So, for example, in Alaska, we did something over about 12 years, and then more recently, we did entire years of sentinel imagery um, last year. And, and it gives you kind of a color coding of where we think we could go and, and fly the LIDAR and when. Um, again, there's always exterior, you know, other environmental impacts of high rains and lots of runoff to go, but at least that gives us kind of a first level basis of looking at when and where to fly. But additionally, in, in some of the development that, that the, the private sector folks have brought in is that they've supplemented satellite imagery um, and, and operationally they'll look at especially the sentinel imagery which is you know collects almost every two days in, in, the, in the U.S. and more frequently in Alaska. They'll supplement that with in situ uh, KD uh, 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 sensors to look at water clarity at, at a sporadic uh, area across the, the survey which Carol you know about and probably can speak better to that than I am but that's really better informed uh, at least operations of when to fly in conjunction with the uh, with the satellite imagery. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Jennifer, do you have anything to add to that, or or are you good with that answer? <laughs> All good. Okay. Um, we did hear that you, you do all collaborate as far as collecting data is concerned. Uh, Jennifer mentioned that unequivocally, and we heard um, some specific examples in each of your talks. Uh, given that we have a suite of accuracy standards, when there is a need for collaboration, how do you decide that there is a need for collaboration, and how do you manage, given that there are different purposes for each program, what accuracy standard gets used? Is it always the highest or financially is that always not always possible? And let's start with Jennifer here. I don't think it's always the highest. Like the three depth, you know, establish quality level two as their, you know, base LIDAR. So that would be the minimum specification. Um, we have a quality level 2B um, that is actually looks like it's between IH order, for those of you familiar with that one, and special order, but it's essentially the seasonal um, computed depth accuracy specification that I think we all still adhere to. I'll get Mike and Jeff to correct me if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think that's pretty much what we, we all pretty much adhere to. Is that right, guys? Concur, yes. Yep. <laughs> so I'm kind of out of questions. Any arm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm out of questions and I'm not seeing any more come in. Um, so I may hand us, I'm not sure if we go to a break next. Maybe you all get a longer break. Uh, I'm going to hand us back to, to Mark, uh, our master of proceedings here. And well, well before one. everybody goes, before everybody goes, Mike shared uh, one of his funny stories. Anybody else got a story they Good want to point. tell? Them? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. I've got a better <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so we were testing, uh, flying the, the URL sensor, which is a developmental sensor out of NASA. Um, Wayne Wright, who's uh, just a a legend in the industry had built this and uh, had a very bright uh, military officer pilot. Um, and we were doing a ground test of the, of the sensor. And he took his, his shiny new brand new digital camera as it was sitting there lighting up the ground and try to take a picture of the laser, uh, which of course cooked his camera. Um, so, but when he sent it back to Kodak, they, they sent him back a new camera with a note asking him to please explain what had happened because they'd never seen it such damage to <laughs> one of their cameras ever. <laughs> and I won't say it was Adam Dunbar, but it was Adam Dunbar. But anyway, that means anything like that. <laughs> and one of the smartest guys I've ever worked with too, which is like, and Wayne was sitting there going, what are you doing, man? You <laughs> just took that camera. <laughs> anyway. Excellent. Well, right. I want to thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time to present today. You obviously did a really excellent job since there are n no more questions from the audience. And uh, yeah, thanks for allowing me to moderate. And back to you, Mark. Cheers. All right. Thank you, Carol, Cindy, Jennifer, Jeff, Mike, Jason. Thank you for being there. You know, it's always great to hear about agencies working together. Um, when MAPS goes to the Hill and advocates for a program, um, whether it be 3DEP or you know, Digital Coast Act, whatever it happens to be, 
one of the things that we use as a talking point is um, a discussion about the, the, it's not just a program for that agency. Other agencies are involved. They share data, um, uh, they provide data to each other. So it, it's always good to hear uh, that that actually goes on.